I was drawing cartoons when I was a little kid. I remember one cartoon I drew, it was a guy in prison and he was eating, and he was eating beans. Because I heard, if you go to prison, that's all you get to eat is beans. And out of his butt, I wrote toot toot, because beans, beans, the magical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. And to me, that was a serious drawing, but I showed it to my parents, and they just started laughing and laughing. They thought it was hilarious. So I like that reaction, the humor and the laughter. Well, my name is William Stout. I'm an artist and a writer, and I've worked in about every field of art that you can imagine. I've done movie posters, record album covers, CD covers, theme park design, design motion pictures. If it's got art, you name it, I've probably done it. So I, I kept drawing. I, I loved comic books and stuff, and I would copy comic books. But uh, what I really wanted to be, I wanted to be a doctor. So I was really good at science and math. I was a science and math major all through school until my last two years of high school. My first year of high school, I went to Reseda High in the San Fernando Valley, fantastic school. But we moved to the Thousand Oaks region, and I went to Thousand Oaks High School, and I, it was just the opposite. And so I was not getting a good education. Uh, the school made school spirit mandatory. You had to attend the pep rallies. I would ditch the pep rallies because I had no interest in football or sports whatsoever. And I'd go to the library to try to educate myself, and they would give me detention for that. So my last semester, I thought, you know, I'm going to graduate from high school. I'm going to be two years behind all the other med students. I better think of something else. And I thought, well, I've always drawn, and I've always been a pretty good drawer. I changed my major to art my very last semester of high school. And uh, my family was dirt poor, so there's no way they could even afford a community college. But fortunately, I got perfect scores on my SATs, and the state of California gave me a full four-year scholarship to any university I wanted to go to. Uh, my friends thought I was nuts that I wasn't going to go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton. They said, you're choosing an art school? And uh, at that time, there were three main art schools in LA. There was Art Center, Art Center College of Design. There was uh, California Institute of the Arts. We referred to it by its old name, the Chouinard Art Institute. And then there was Otis. Otis was primarily a fine arts school back then. And my aunt, who was my algebra teacher, who was also an art teacher, uh, took me on a tour of these three schools. And I decided I, I wanted to go to uh, Chouinard. And so that's where I applied my scholarship. I was there for four years, and my major was illustration. At that time, I think Chouinard was probably the best art school in the world, certainly in the country. Uh, head of the music department was Ravi Shankar. The head of the fashion department was Edith Head, who has won more Oscars for costume design than any other person in history. The animation department was taught by Disney's Nine Old Men, considered the greatest nine greatest animators who ever lived. The illustration department, the head of that was Hal Kramer. He was the very first president of the Society of Illustrators. So it was an amazing place to be, especially in the late 1960s. So they had an incredible policy in the illustration department, which was if you got any real work on the outside, you could turn that in in lieu of your homework. So my last two years of art school, almost everything I was turning in was a real job. So it made the transition from academia to the real world absolutely seamless. And they had a jobs bulletin board at school. And one day I looked and says, there was a big eight and a half by 11 sheets stuck on the bulletin board, said we're looking for an artist who likes to draw horror, science fiction, fantasy stuff. Uh, it's for a new magazine. So they're having a contest to do the first cover. So I submitted three pieces and they chose one to be the cover. And I asked them, I said, well, who's doing the inside illustrations? Oh, the art director is doing those. I said, can I see his work? Sure. So they showed me his work, it was horrible. <laughs> it's just, I said, how about if I do the interior stuff as well? So I did the covers and all the interior illustrations to the first four issues of a national magazine called Coven 13. It was a pulp magazine with, you know, stories about vampires and werewolves and stuff like that. So I was in heaven. And it meant that in 1968, I was able to finally start supporting myself from my art just uh, a year and a half into art school. And I was taking any job that came my way. I did the very first uh, advertising for Toyota. <laughs> I did posters for Taco Bell, which is a brand new company back then, showing white people with safe to eat Mexican food. 
<laughs> Seriously. What that was doing, my taking every job that came along, I was finding out what I didn't want to do. And I started to gravitate towards uh, movie posters. At that time, movie posters and illustrations for annual reports were the two best paying jobs an illustrator could have. I got a call from an ad agency I'd been doing work for in Westwood. They said, we got something different for you this time, Bill. Uh, we're gonna have you do a movie poster. I go, oh, cool, I love movies. It's, what, what is it? They said, it's a full length animated feature uh, directed by Ralph Bakshi called Wizards. And I said, wow, cool. Okay, I came over, I said, you can show me the movie? They said, no, you'll do a better poster if you don't see the film. And I thought, well, that doesn't speak well of this movie. I said, but, and how do you expect me to, to do a poster if I don't know what's in the movie? And they gave me a stack of really fuzzy frame blow-ups. And I said, I can barely make out what's going on in these. You know, it helps a little bit. I can sort of see what the movie's about. And uh, then I got one of the best pieces of advice uh, I've ever received from an art director. They said, Bill, just do the poster as if it was your movie. And I said, well, I can do that. Oh, cool. So I did the poster for Wizards, and uh, it was amazing. Uh, that's still probably the most recognized piece of art I've ever done. And I, I still get requests to sign that poster to this day. It's just extraordinary. And I still haven't seen the film. <laughs> So I did the very first commercialization of Star Wars. I got hired to do 22 Coca-Cola cup designs for uh, Burger King. And George Lucas became a great friend and, and fan of my work. And about every few years, he'd find some job he wanted me to do. And one year, he wanted me to, they were gonna re-release uh, American Graffiti. So they wanted a new poster for that. And so uh, George insisted that I be the artist that they use. Well, the ad agency, they'd never heard of me. They didn't know if I could make a deadline or if my work was decent or stuff. But I, I did the job because uh, Lucas forced them to have me do the art. And then they were delighted and they were really pleased with, with what I was doing. They saw I could do good likenesses, do good caricatures. And so this was Seinegren Associates and they, they did about 80 to 90 percent of the movie posters in town. So I began to do work for them and man that was like incredible. I was making money hand over fist. And I was having a blast because it was the last golden age of movie poster illustration. I couldn't wait to come in each time to Seinegger's to just to see who was working on what. Uh, there'd be like Drew Struzan's sort of uh, Alphonse Mucha meets Lion Decker art. Dan Gouzet did a Streets of Fire poster that looked like Russian agitprop art. And it was, it was always a surprise as to what was going on. My very first movie I worked on was uh, for the Firesign Theater. They were a four-man comedy group based in Los Angeles. Uh, They're sort of the Beatles of comedy. They're amazing. They were before Monty Python. And a friend of mine got permission to reprint a sort of a local neighborhood fanzine newsletter called uh, Mixville Rocket. And he asked me if I would do the cover. So I did the cover. Firesign Theater loved it. They started having me do all their album covers. Then we started making a film together. They had made an album called Everything You Know Is Wrong. And they shot a movie to the album. So they recorded all the sound first and everybody lip synced to all the dialogue. And I built all the props for that and uh, did t-shirt designs for them. It was really Conan that launched my film career. A friend of mine uh, was working as a production assistant on Conan the Barbarian. He said, man, Bill, you got to come in and see what's being done on this, this show. He says, I know you're a huge Robert E. Howard fan. That was the guy who wrote the Conan novels. And I said, I would love to, but I'm, I'm just too busy. I've got, I think that one particular week I had eight movie posters in the LA Times calendar section. Just by sheer coincidence, they all got released the same week. And so I wanted to see what they were doing, especially when I found out that Ron Cobb, who I knew as a political cartoonist, was, had been hired as the production designer. And I thought, what would this political cartoonist be doing with Conan? Now, I'd seen some of the cantina sequence creatures that he had designed for Star Wars. So I knew he could do stuff like that. But uh, I finally got a break in my schedule. But instead of going to the Conan offices to see what was being done, I went to the ABA. That was the American Booksellers Association. Every year, they would have a meeting of all the publishers and all the editors in the entire country, either in New York 
or in LA, and that here happened to be in LA. So it was a perfect place if you're an artist to bring your portfolio and go booth to booth to booth and pick up enough work for the rest of the year. So that was my plan. But the first person I ran into at the ABA was Ron Cobb. And Ron said, look, Bill, you're my first choice for who I want to work with on Conan the Barbarian. But I have an agreement with the director, John Milius, uh, that he has veto power over anybody I want to hire. I have veto power over anybody he wants to hire for the art department. So would you mind dropping off your portfolio for John to see? I thought, well, it could be interesting. See how movies are made. And uh, went into the Conan offices that next day, which was a Friday, and Milius happened to be there. I handed him my book, he looked through it. He remembered a story I'd done for heavy metal that he had really liked. It was a story written by Harlan Ellison called Shattered Like a Glass Goblin. And he quickly leafed through the rest of it, handed me my book back and started to walk out the room. And, and John's a bigger than life sort of guy, character. And over his shoulder, he said, hire him. So I went in to see Buzz Feichens, who was our line producer. Buzz told me what I would be making on Conan and I nearly fell off the chair laughing. This is about 10% of what I was making in advertising. But I thought, well, it's just for two weeks. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how movies are made. I found out later, you're always hired for two weeks on a film. They want to find out whether or not you're a jerk. And if you're a jerk after the two weeks is up, your job's over and no hard feelings. So my two weeks turned into two years and turned into a film career. John Milius at that time was producing a film for Steven Spielberg called 1941. So we were sharing offices with Steven Spielberg. My receptionist, when I started there, was Kathleen Kennedy. Within a couple months, she was John Millis's personal assistant, and a few months after that, she was Steven Spielberg's personal assistant, and then in the next two years, she produced E.T. So, incredible rise. And uh, in my naivete, I thought it would always be like that. But uh, Ron Cobb and I would work on Conan during the day and then run across to Steven's office and we'd kick around ideas for his next project, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. So Steven and John Milius were best of friends, but they were also rivals. And they were constantly trying to one-up each other. And whatever one had, the other wanted. They are sort of like kids that way. And John Milius had me and Ron Cobb. So Steven wanted to get us to jump ship and leave Conan and work on Raiders of the Lost Ark full time. And he especially wanted Cobb. And I came in one day, I said, Ron, you look miserable, what is it? He says, well, it's Steven. He said, if I would leave Conan and uh, become the production designer for Raiders of the Lost Ark, he'd let me direct the sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I went, oh my God, <laughs> Ron, what did you say? Ron said, I, I told him, I can't do that to John. John gave me a tremendous break in the film business by making me the production designer of Conan. So we went off to Europe and we made Conan and when we got back Spielberg contacted Cobb and said look I still want you to direct the sequel to Close Encounters. So Ron found out about this supposed true story about a shootout between two different groups of aliens over a farm in Nebraska and he started writing a screenplay with John Sayles, a great screenwriter, uh, called Night Skies and he hired Rick Baker to start building the creatures for Night Skies. And around this time, I decided I'd pay Ron a visit, see how he was doing. And I said, Ron, he looks shell-shocked. What's going on? He goes, ah, it's Steven. He's finished Raiders Lost Ark. Now he's turned his attention to my film. And every day he comes in and he makes a change to my movie. He's made so many changes now, it doesn't feel like my film anymore. I would give anything to get off this film. And a couple days later, Spielberg came into Ron's office and said, Ron, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I got to direct this film. I'll give you $10,000 and a point in the movie if you'll walk away. And so Ron accepted that deal. And nine months later, Ron was invited to the cast and crew screening of this film. And Ron said, oh, thank God I didn't make this movie. It is so overly sentimental. I, oh, I'm, I'm glad Stephen made it. And they forgot about it until about eight months later, uh, they're looking into Hollywood trade papers and it says this film, which is no longer called Night Skies, but is now called E.T. the Extraterrestrial, has grossed over $400 million. And Ron's wife says, Ron, don't we have a point in that film? So they look through the papers and they found the, find the agreement with Steven Spielberg and they call up Universal and Universal says, oh, thank God, it's the first verifiable point we can pay off on. Uh, we'll have a messenger over 
within an hour with your first check. And I think the first check was around $875,000. Well, they had one of Stevens points, which included Blu-rays, DVDs, merchandising, toys. So Ron Cobb made over $10 million for not directing E.T. Only in Hollywood. So when I was three years old, my parents took me to see my very first movie. This was before anyone in our neighborhood had a television. Uh, the only way you could see movies was to go to the movie theaters. And they took me to the Reseda Drive-In. It was 1952, and it was for the re-release of the original 1933 King Kong. That's the first movie I ever saw. It's still my favorite movie of all time. I, I've seen uh, that film probably over a hundred times. And King Kong, I first started seeing it a lot after seeing it at the drive-in. Uh, in the mid or early 1960s, they had something called the Million Dollar Movie on TV, where they would pick a film and they would show it twice a day, then three times on Saturday and three times on Sunday. Well, the first film they picked for that was King Kong, and I watched every single showing. And that was so successful, they made King Kong the second Million Dollar Movie. So I watched all of those screenings. So in the space of two weeks, I, I had seen Kong over 30 times. So it's still such an inspiration. It, it works for me on every level. Well, my first influences were three DC Comics artists. Carmine Infantino, who drew The Flash and Mystery in Space, uh, Adam Strange. Uh, Gil Kane, who drew The Atom and Green Lantern. And then my favorite guy to ink both of those guys was a guy named Murphy Anderson. And a friend of mine, Fred Romanek, he introduced me to the world of comic book fandom. And, and some of the comic books, like the ones edited by Julie Schwartz, he, he edited uh, Flash, Green Lantern, Mystery in Space, The Atom. People would write letters in, and if he liked your letter, he'd send you some original art. So my friend Fred got an entire story, an Adam Strange story, that uh, drawn by Carmen Infantino and inked by Murphy Anderson, and it blew me away. It was astonishingly great stuff. And they immediately became huge influences on me. And I was shocked to see that they weren't drawn comic book size, they were drawn big and then reduced down. I didn't know that. And uh, they were inked with India ink, not a ballpoint pen. So I was learning how to do comics. When I was 14, I discovered my first book written by Edgar S. Burroughs. He was the guy who created Tarzan and John Carter of Mars. And it was a John Carter of Mars book. It was the third volume in the series called Warlord of Mars. I read that, it blew me away. And I thought, and there's more of these? Fantastic. And I started to do my own drawings of the characters and stuff. And there were two artists who were doing the paperback covers and, and pen sketches. Uh, one was Roy Krenkel and the other was Frank Frazetta. And both of those guys instantly became two of my biggest influences, especially for Zeta. I followed his career really closely. He had worked uh, on Little Abner as an assistant to Al Cap. He, I worked on a, uh, a syndicated strip. I worked on Tarzan of the Apes with Russ Manning. Uh, he did movie posters, so I did movie posters. Frank did album covers, so I did album covers. And so it gave me a sort of a path and a guide to possible uh, career choices. And then I became influenced by the guys who influenced those two guys, which is mostly early 20th century children's book illustrators like Arthur Rackham, Edmund Dulac, the Detmold Brothers, William Heath Robinson, and also the late 19th century painters. My f favorite landscape painter, Thomas Moran, who was responsible for our national park system. All those guys became big influences on me and uh, art of this day. And, uh, Jack Kirby, another great influence. Uh, Mobius, Jean Giraud. I, I was lucky enough to become friends with Jean and I got to hire him and we worked together on Masters of the Universe. And I got to ink uh, an issue of The Demon pencil by Jack Kirby and I learned an enormous amount from inking Jack's work. Creating is my favorite thing to do in life and it, and it can be creating food, it can be creating art, it can be creating sculpture, writing. Anything that's creative, I am up for. And uh, the jobs I like the best are the hardest ones. I, when I get hired on a film, I say, okay, what's the toughest problem you're having? I want to solve it. And that, that became my specialty in solving the most difficult problems in film. And my favorite work of everything that I do is painting accurate reconstructions of prehistoric life as murals for natural history museums. I've got 12 murals at the San Diego Natural History Museum, two at the San Diego Zoo. My first two were for the Houston Museum of Natural Science. They depicted life before the dinosaurs. And I did three uh, murals for 
Walt Disney's Animal Kingdom for Dino Land, including the very first reconstruction of Sue, the, the famous Tyrannosaurus Rex. The very first thing I ever did for Mattel was I did the, the box art for Big Jim. Uh, Big Jim was an adventure character, and uh, the reason they hired me to do the box art is uh, at that time there were very strict laws about how you present toys to kids, and you can't lie to the kids and oversell something. And so if, if you had paintings of the toys, those had to be really accurate. But if you did it as like comic book art, different rules applied and so I could be a little more adventurous. So I, I did several big gym toys and then they put me on, uh, I remember they called me up, they said, we know you can draw a big gym, but uh, can you draw army men? I go, of course I can draw army men. I've got a sample right here on my board. Would you like to see it? Yeah, can you, can you come over tomorrow and show us your army man? Sure, hung up the phone and did the drawing because I didn't have to sit in there. <laughs> but if, if I could draw Big Jim, of course I could draw army men. What's, what's the difference yeah, other than clothes, you know? And same thing happened when they hired me to do the, the SWAT boxes, SWAT toys. We know you can draw army guys, but can you draw SWAT officer? Yeah, I can do that. They had me do some other stuff as well. And uh, I had gotten into the film business around that time. And I started out as a storyboard artist on Conan and then did storyboards for First Blood, did all the action sequences for First Blood. Every January, I would get five film offers as production designer. And I'd have to decide which one I wanted to do. And uh, I had two sons at the time. And I also understood that if I say yes to this film, it means that I am agreeing not to see my sons for the next year or two. Because the only time I'll see them is when they're asleep. Because if I'm doing my job right, I'm working 18 hour days, seven days a week. And the only time I'll see my family and my wife and kids is when they're sleeping. And I thought, that's a big price to pay. But uh, it was a crucial price, because when I go to shows like Comic-Cons and things like that, the first question I almost always get is, are you working on any movies? And if I say no, they turn around and walk away. But if I say, yeah, I've just designed the Predator for this film called Predator. They'll stay, they'll talk, they'll buy stuff. And so films is the core, is the currency of, of fame in our society. So I realized I gotta keep working in movies, otherwise I'll be totally forgotten. So I originally got hired to do storyboards on Masters of the Universe. And the director, Gary Goddard, and I really hit it off. We enjoyed all the same art, and we sort of sp spoke a shorthand with each other. If he told me, he says, oh, Bill, I like that drawing. Can you Kirby it up a little bit more? I would know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about Jack Kirby, and he's talking about making things a little more heroic and more godlike. And so I got along great with Gary. The production designer who was working on the film when I got hired, uh, Jeff Kirkland, he and Gary did not see eye to eye on anything. And uh, I remember one time, Gary, Gary is one of the greatest pitch men in the business. I mean, he could, he could sell ice to Eskimos. And he was taking all the, mis, uh, the Mattel brass around and, and showing them the work that was being done on Masters of the Universe. And he was saving the best for last, which was the art department. So he brings them into the art department, shows them all these designs. Man, you could see in their eyes, they were so excited, they're so thrilled, so pumped up. And Gary turned to uh, Jeff for affirmation and Jeff looks up, he goes, it's not going to be too fucking awful. <laughs> Just pop that balloon, man. Just like, oh my God. Well, two weeks later, Jeff decided he was going to leave the film and he recommended I take over as production designer. And that's how I became the production designer for the film. Uh, my friend Jean Giraud, also known as Mobius, was living in Santa Monica at the time, trying to get a film project of his off the ground. So I got to hire Jean to work on Masters of the Universe as well, which was just pure heaven. Working with Jean Giraud and working with Ron Cobb, it's like sitting next to two fountains that gush great ideas all day long, seemingly effortlessly. Uh, I consider both of those guys geniuses, and that's a word I don't use for hardly anybody, but Ron Cobb and Jean Giraud, genius, pure genius. So Mattel, one day, they were walking through the art department and they were going, oh, that's gonna make a great toy. Man, I said, gentlemen, I was hired to design this motion picture, but I was not hired to design your next year's toy line. We need to renegotiate. 
And they're like, what? I go, yeah. So I got the other five designers working on the film. We acted as a buck. We wanted to participate in the uh, royalties from the toys. Mattel threatened to shut down the film eight times. We just kept working away until finally they realized they had to see to our demands. So that was a huge, huge breakthrough in the film business. Masters of the Universe uh, became actually third film as production designer. I was production designer for two years on an American Godzilla film that didn't get made. And then I was production designer on a little low budget horror film written and directed by Dan O'Bannon, the guy who wrote Alien, called Return of the Living Dead. And that became a huge, huge cult movie. And that, that was my first film as production designer for a film that actually got made. The writer-director, Dan O'Bannon, he came to me and said, Bill, you know how films have principal characters? I go, yeah, I want our film to have principal zombies. I want you to design zombies like people have never seen before. I thought, cool, That's, that sounds like a great assignment. And so the first creature I did was the Tar Man. O'Bannon saw it said, that's it. You don't need to do anything else except, you know, turnarounds. And so, uh, yeah, I was, I was having the time of my life doing that stuff. And I'm a real hands-on production designer. There's a scene where they have what's called the half corpse, this woman who got cut in half, and they, she's a zombie, and they've got her tied down to this gurney, and she's telling them what it's like to be dead and brought back to life and how painful it is and stuff. Well, it was built by Tony Gardner, and it was one of his first film jobs. And Tony was operating the arms. I was underneath the gurney operating the spine, making it flop around a new spinal fluid. And then Brian Peck, who played Scuzz, he was operating the head and doing the temporary dialogue. It was just so cool to be hands-on like that. Because we didn't have any money, so, you know, everybody pitched in. Boy, am I a collector. You just ask my wife. <laughs> that poor patient lady. Yeah, I, I collect art, I collect books, I collect music. I've got over 20,000 albums. I've got a, probably about 6,000 CDs. I've got art by my favorite artists. Sometimes I'll do swaps with, if they like my stuff and I like their stuff, we'll trade pictures. That's something that's cool. I traded a self-portrait for a beautiful Charlie Russell bronze of a wolf looking at a human bone. Incredible. Collecting's always been really important for me. I don't know, it still gives me tremendous satisfaction. One of the coolest things I've acquired is a, a cast of the Tyrannosaurus Rex skull at the Natural History Museum in LA County. Uh, it, at the time, it was the biggest T-Rex skull ever found. And at that time, too, it was also, I think it was only the sixth T-Rex ever found. For a while, T-Rexes were incredibly rare fossils to find. I've got a uh, Peruvian mummy head with all the skin and all the hair and teeth and everything preserved. I've got an Egyptian mummy hand uh, from about 3,000 years ago. I'm a huge fan of Charles R. Knight. Charles R. Knight was the artist who visually defined dinosaurs for the rest of the world. If you pick up any dinosaur book between, say, 1920 and 1950, it's probably got his dinosaurs in it. It was his dinosaurs they used for Fantasia. It was his dinosaurs they used for King Kong. and. Man, uh, I've got a bronze T-Rex that he did. I've got charcoal drawings that he did, pencil drawings that he did. I became friends with his daughter and with his granddaughter and with his great-granddaughter. His, his uh, granddaughter used to call me every single day. I personally can't believe what I've accomplished throughout my career. The people that I've met, people that I got to work with. I had some of the greatest mentors in all the different businesses I've worked in. I feel in many ways like the luckiest guy in the world. One thing I wish is that my old studio on the Brea, I wish we'd kept a log book recording everyone who came through that studio because it was all the greatest film directors, comedians, actors, writers, sculptors. It was amazing the number of people that came through our studio. At the time I was sharing the front part with uh, Richard Hescox, who was painting science fiction book covers, and Dave Stevens, who at my studio created The Rocketeer. When Dave left the studio, he got replaced by Paul Chadwick, and, and Paul created Concrete in our studio. So that place had such history going for it. Just, just unbelievable. 
I got a few pieces of advice I give to aspiring artists. One is always do 100% of your best work. After the negotiation's over, no matter how little or how much you're paid, being paid, do your absolute best work. Uh, it'll do two things. It will greatly surprise and please your client because they're not expecting you to do this fantastic piece of work for them. Uh, and it will make you a better artist because you're pushing yourself to be better and better. Uh, the other thing is, the uh, quickest way to get good is figure drawing. Do as much figure drawing as possible. I still do figure drawing every Sunday at my studio. And I'm, I'm still finding secrets of the human body revealed to me with each drawing. Uh, if you want to become good as a painter, do plein air painting. That's where you set up an easel outside and you do a little landscape painting. It teaches you color, design, and uh, composition. Norman Rockwell wrote a great autobiography called My Adventures as an Illustrator. And he had carved out of wood 100% and, and then he had a gold leaf on top of that and that sits at the top of his easel. And that reminds me, always do 100% of your best work. Uh, you want to just keep getting better and better as an artist. And one of the great things about being an artist, there's always another plateau to ascend to. Uh, you're never finished learning if you're a good artist. If you are finished learning, you should just hang it up and not doing it <laughs> anymore. The other thing is value your own work. I think you should be your, your own biggest fan. Uh, personally, I can't wait to see the next picture I'm gonna do. It might be a masterpiece. I won't know till I do it. Probably won't be a masterpiece because those are few and rare, but until I do it, I won't know. And uh, I noticed that usually the weakest part of each artist in their career is their business sense. Most artists do not have a good business sense. So I give free business lectures on how to negotiate and how to write co contracts. And uh, I think that's really important to uh, value your own work. Greg Irons, who's an underground cartoonist and a, and a tattoo artist, a great friend of mine. There's a piece of his I wanted to buy so bad, but he wouldn't come down in price. And I said, Greg, I really respect you for that. You should get the price you think that deserves. So, value your own work. And keep everything. Uh, they don't need original art to make a movie. They can work with copies. Especially now where you can scan stuff, do high quality scans. And uh, when I get into negotiations with the film studio, they say, well, we keep all the original art. I said, no. I said, do you have a 401k? And they said, yeah, okay, of course. See that art there? That's my 401k. And they understand that. So if you'd like to see my work, my website's really easy, williamstout.com. Uh, if you want to talk to me or email me, just hit the contact button, it goes right to me. And I have a shop on my website. You can buy my books, my art, uh, toys, all different kinds of stuff, album covers. Mostly just check in from time to time. I, I've got a couple of big projects coming out in the near future. My regular publisher, uh, John Flesky's, the, he was the president of Flesk Publications. He's doing a big three volume box set of all my comics related art. I also uh, have a friend, Jim Earp, who's a great writer. He called me up, he said, I'm doing this project. Uh, it's, I've written 24 poems based on the life of Willis O'Brien. Willis O'Brien was the guy who animated King Kong, the original 1933 King Kong. And I said, could I see those? And he sent them to me. And I said, Jim, I want to illustrate each one of these. So my regular publisher is going to uh, publish that book as well. Uh, my most requested book is a book on all my music-related art. In the mid-1970s, I did about 45 bootleg record album covers, and people really would like to see a book collecting all of that work. And I've kept 95% of all the designs I've done for motion pictures, so I'm going to do a big book on all my film design. I want to do another big book on all my entertainment advertising, all my movie posters, and concert posters and it's just a great way to get my work out there and for people to see my work. If you want to overall look at my career I've got this spectacular book out called Fantastic Worlds the Art of William Stout. It weighs six pounds and each chapter covers a different aspect of my career. So there's a chapter on dinosaurs, a chapter on comics, a chapter on film design, a chapter on music. I highly recommend that book. I've never lost the thrill of seeing my work reproduced in, in various forms as toys or movies or uh, television shows or cartoons. I just get a big kick out of seeing my work in public spaces. 
and most artists work alone, so you don't really find out if your work is affecting people. And I'm a guest at uh, comic book conventions, science fiction conventions, horror movie conventions, and I love doing those shows because I get to meet my audience. I get to find out if my work is having a positive effect on somebody. In fact, I was just in Atlanta for the biggest show in the South called Dragon Con, and I had this incredible moment. A guy came up to my table, and he purchased a few things, and he said he was a huge longtime fan of my work. And he's starting to go, and I said, where did you first see my work? And he turned around and he said, Iraq. And I went, Iraq? He said, yeah, I was in the Marines. I was in Iraq. It was pure hell, pure hell. I was just, every day was just a nightmare. The only thing that kept me going was your work. It showed me that there was beauty outside of this hellscape. And then I went to give him his change. He says, I'm not gonna take your change. He walked away. 